And this is NPR News. I'm Mike Mulcahy. Thanks for tuning in today. Come November 6th, voters will decide who will serve in each of Minnesota's eight congressional districts for the next two years. Between now and Election Day, we will host a series of meetings between the major party candidates for those seats. Today, we start with Minnesota's 4th Congressional District, which covers the East Metro area, including all of St. Paul and its northern and eastern suburbs all the way to the St. Croix River. Since 2001, the seat has been held by Democrat Betty McCollum. She is a member of the House Appropriations Committee, and before she was elected to the U.S. House, served four terms as a state representative. Her Republican opponent this year is Greg Ryan, who also ran two years ago. Greg Ryan lives in Roseville and, with his family, owns and operates the Ryan Plumbing and Heating Company. Thanks to both candidates for being here. I wonder if we could just forego the opening statements, and I'll just ask... Why should voters elect you? And let's start with Greg Ryan. Well, I've got 34 years of experience in running a business uh, since my uh, father's tragic uh, passing. And I've just been watching the 4th District be just at a stable position. Uh, The congresswoman has been there, been a 32-year politician, two years less than I have been a business owner. So that's where we're going at. And of the late, a lot of these uh, things that have been taking place recently in the news about uh, Keith Ellison, I'd really like to know her position on where she sits and where she believes Keith Ellison should uh, testify or have an FBI interview. So that's kind of where I'm at with uh, wanting to represent the 4th District. Okay, Betty McCollum, why should uh, voters elect you to another term? Well, it's been an honor to serve, and I, as has been pointed out, I had the privilege of serving on the city council in in North St. Paul while I was a substitute teacher, and and then when I served in the Minnesota State House, which is a part-time position, I was a retail um, manager at uh, at Sears at at Maplewood Mall. So um, all the experience um, that, that I have had, um, both at, at a local government level and at a state level, I took with me to Congress. And so when I've been out door knocking, uh, people are asking me to go to make sure that I'm uh, fighting to make sure that their health care pre existing uh, conditions are covered. They want to see smart investments made in transit and transportation. They're very concerned about, uh, you know, parents, the cost of college and uh, the educational system here and want someone who will work with state and local officials to make sure that we're moving Minnesota forward. And I'm also hearing at the door and I'm Um, very, very much in favor of doing this, is holding this administration accountable for a lot of the corruption that um, I I just saw straight out uh, as a ranking member on the Interior uh, Subcommittee of Appropriations with um, all the things that um, Administrator Scott Pruitt of the EPA was was doing um, to, uh, in my opinion, and he he resigned Mm -hmm. to fraud taxpayers. Okay, uh, we'll get to President Trump and we'll get to Keith Ellison in just a minute. But uh, let me ask first, uh, Betty McCollum, stay with you. You voted against the Republican bill that cut taxes uh, that passed uh, last year. Why did you vote against that bill? Well, that bill had uh, several things wrong with it. One of the 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 opportunities that could have happened with a tax bill uh, would have been with the Republicans working with the Democrats. Democrats were totally shut out of the process. And even as the bill was being written uh, and voted on in the Senate, they were writing things in the margin. So it didn't have the oversight. It didn't have the scrutiny that it deserved. And so now uh, the Republicans have a tax bill that's going to add almost $2 trillion um, to what the American uh, people will have in, in their in the debt. Uh, over the next 10 years. And so now my Republican colleagues are saying, well, we have to come up with money to pay for these tax cuts somehow. So they're talking about uh, cuts to Social Security. They're talking about cuts to Medicare and Medicaid, which um, our seniors uh, here in Minnesota and around the country rely upon in order to live lives of dignity after they retire. And I'm just not going to be part of that. Greg Ryan, would you have voted for the tax cut bill? Uh, I would have, and I don't think it went far enough. All we need to do is look at the economy and the way it is just roaring. We are at an all-time low as far as unemployment applications. We're at an all-time high for uh, minorities being uh, employed. All uh, all of the uh, Minnesota is at about three percent unemployment rate. We're at 
about a 20-year low uh, as far as uh, unemployment. So I believe that this just started in the last year or two after the administration uh, took over. So I think that this is uh, a sign of the robust economy due to the strong uh, leadership that we have in Washington and the way we are, are moving forward. So that's uh, the way I see it, and I'm feeling it because I am in business, and I do talk to the people out in the 4th District. So um, and I'm still curious about uh, Betty's position on Keith Ellison. Okay, we'll get to that. But w- would you pledge to protect uh, Medicare and Social Security if, uh, if, it, if it's proposed to cut those? Social Security, yes. Medicare, uh, I believe that uh, Congress, Congressman Walls, through the state, if he becomes the governor, he would like to have Medicaid for all, which is uh, not good because it really gives us zero choice. We're starting to experience less choice when it comes to health care costs. Okay. Uh, Betty McCollum, uh you, it sounds like you would pledge to not cut Medicare or Social Security. No, I mean Social Security and and is uh, is stable for us, uh, you know, until uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2026 and Medicaid for uh, a while after that. There there do need to be some reforms that are made, and one of the reforms that we can do is rein in the cost of prescription drugs to help lower the the cost of uh, Medicare and Medicaid, and for um, all people who are buying prescription drugs. But I want to go back to the economy because the people who who have benefited the most under the tax cuts have been the upper 1% of Americans and and corporations. And corporations uh, took uh, the the money that that they're receiving back in the tax cuts. The thought was that they were going to be reinvesting in our in our communities, reinvesting in their businesses. Instead, they've been doing stock buyouts, which only benefits them more. And people I'm talking with uh, at the door, they're very concerned. They haven't seen their wages go up in decades. Um, they're, they're working. They're, they're grateful they're working. They know the unemployment here in Minnesota, the unemployment rate is low, but they're not feeling the same success that the corporations and businesses are. So, And some of them still are very concerned about uh, you know housing and, and being able to have a affordable housing. So most of the folks that I've been talking to out in the suburb, they're they're feeling like they're kind of walking on eggshells right now when it comes to the economy. It's good, but it's not as good as it should be for them. Greg Ryan, that's back just wrong. Economy. She's she's been out of touch as far as the economy goes. I'm out there trying to solicit customers to convince them to hire me. Every time I turn around and look for an employee, I have to pay more money. So we are actually offering more salary as is a lot of other employers just because of the scarcity of talent when we go out there to try and find talent for our businesses we are faced with raising scales or raising rates in order to attract better talent and as far as the one percent those are the people that are hiring the small businesses those are the people that are adding on to the plant those are the people that are buying the equipment those are the people that are positioning themselves to be uh, better performers with the artificial intelligence and a lot of the robotics that they do implement into their industries and their businesses so that one percent of the people are basically one of the largest employers for small companies Betty McCollum? Well, I mean, the, the, fa- the facts are there. The corporations are doing stock buyouts. It's been reported in all the, in all the, the, the trade journals and that. And teachers, uh, nurses, uh, people who work in retail, um, they, they aren't seeing their, their wages go up. Um, they're not being able to keep up with inflation, and they're not being able to put away for their retirement that they w- the way they'd like to. What they have seen for those who want to send uh, and help uh, with their young adult children either go to vocational trade school or for college, they're seeing that, that that ability to help their children take the next step to become part of an, uh, a society with great opportunity is uh, really being uh, out of their reach because they're seeing college and, and trade school costs go up and they're not seeing their wages go up so they can help their children attain the next step towards the American dream. Uh, Betty McCollum, uh, you said a few months ago that uh, you thought President Trump should be impeached. Uh, do you still feel that way, and why? 
I think we should. Lo- I think we should be very serious about looking at moving forward on articles of impeachment, and it should go to the Judiciary Committee. We need uh, to hold President Trump accountable. This is the first president in you know in, in my lifetime that hasn't turned over their tax records. There's very serious concerns that we have about the emoluments clause and the amount of money that's going back into his business, whether it's Trump hotels, uh, the time that he spends in Mar-a-Lago, or his um, uh, other business business in, um, in New Jersey. And the whole family's employed up there, uh, pretty much at the White House. So he has not done what other presidents have done in the past with their businesses. And the Republicans have refused um, on party line votes to look at the president's taxes. If there's nothing there, then the president should um, uh, turn his taxes over so the American people know that the president is living within the spirit and the law, uh, which is spelled out very clearly in the U.S. Constitution when it comes to emoluments. Greg Ryan, where do you stand on President Trump? Um, <clears throat> there's so much divide happening. I am in full support of President Trump and the way he's doing uh, his business. You have to look at a lot of the uh, way the administration is moving. Now, if... Uh, Ms. McCollum is uh, concerned about impeaching Mr. Trump, then she should apply that same thing to uh, Keith Ellison and uh, Ms. Monaghan, who lodged these accusations about domestic abuse. And she has not publicly said anything about the allegations that are lodged against uh, uh, her her, uh, CD4 partner, uh, her congressional friend, um, who she has campaigned with, I have heard nothing about where she would, where she stands on that particular situation. Well, Betty McCollum, here's your chance. Uh, would you, are you backing Keith Ellison for Minnesota Attorney General? Well, uh, these allegations um, that came out uh, just literally days before the election, Keith has addressed them, and so has uh, the the young woman who um, um, was alleges that. You know, she was she was abused and mistreated. She needs to be heard, and there there needs to be uh, transparency in what's happening. Whether it is um, what's happening with um, Judge Kavanaugh right now, um, we had instances even here at NPR with uh, Garrison Keeler and that. We as a society have to make sure women's voices are heard and there's a way when these sexual abuse, because a lot of these aren't criminal cases, right? When there's sexual abuse cases that um, victims can come forward and they can come forward in a way that they know is safe and a way that they will be heard. And then uh, we have to figure out as a society how we move forward with these allegations. I've worked with this on in, in the military with sexual assault and sexual abuse uh, as a member of Congress, and we, we've gotten the military to, to, to kind of turn around its attitude on that. We're seeing improvements there. We're seeing it in the private sector. We've seen it in, in the media. Uh, you know, it's just CBS was, was the latest. This is a systemic problem in our, in our country, in, in the way gender uh, relations uh, need to be handled in a way that is fair and respectful. And um, uh, the reason why I haven't commented is I haven't spoken to, to the uh, young woman involved. The Republicans, if they were serious about this, uh, doing something about this, Mr. Ryan's party could uh, file an ethics complaint against Mr. Ellison, and it could be brought up. Uh, to date, they haven't done that. So there, there is recourse and ways in which it can ha- be handled. And uh, we saw with uh, Mr. Franken, um, he wanted to go to the Ethics Committee, and he wasn't given an opportunity to do that. And a lot of people think everybody should have their chance to have their voice heard. Based on what you've heard about the uh, Keith Ellison situation, will you support him for Minnesota Attorney General? Well, I think that's going to be up to the voters. I mean, I'm just I'm just one vote. Um, and um, I really think that we need to make sure that we have... Uh, all the uh, evidence laid out in front of us. I think there's ways um, in which uh, uh, the, the woman who's made these accusations uh, with, with the tape and that could find a third party, a retired judge or somebody, and, and validate and validate her story more. She needs to be heard. She needs to believe. And I, and I want to make sure that she's able to do that in a, in a, safe, in a safe spot. So, and I think the polit- politicians shouldn't be involved in doing that. I think we need to come up with a society way to remedy and have um, people make sure that, that, they're, that they're being listened to and that everybody's being treated fairly with dignity and respect. And Greg Ryan, based on what uh, you, you say about Keith Ellison, what about uh, Judge Brett Kavanaugh? Should he be uh, 
approve for the Supreme Court with this allegation hanging over his head. Okay, talking about the Supreme Court uh, nomination, it's almost been like a circus that the Democrats have been partaking in. At the beginning, the uh, Democrats coordinated uh, along with media about, you know, the this disruption during the process that took place. This is unprecedented. This is what the Democrats do when they don't get their way. At the 12th hour, uh, they brought up this uh, Dr. Ford about these allegations at the 12th hour. They've been holding on to this information for close to four months or six months. So I think that I, I thought a, it was in July that the allegation was uh, went to Senator Feinstein. Feinstein should have disclosed that to uh, you know the ranking person uh, right out of the right out of the gate, mm-hmm. and she didn't. She waited until the twelfth hour. Maybe it was July, but uh, somebody had this information long, long before that the I, judiciary trying, panel had. I'm just trying to find out though, because there have been allegations made against President Trump too. Are, do you hold Keith Ellison to a different standard than you do to other people who have been accused of of sexual misconduct? Uh, I don't. I don't. But uh, there has been zero investigation going on with Keith Ellison. You know, uh, the people should actually ask for the FBI to do an investigation. This uh, Miss Monahan apparently has a video of the uh, incident, and the son actually had some audio that he passed over onto Facebook or something like that, but it seems like we're not getting a whole lot of information out of that. If uh, Ms. McCollum could actually uh, request the FBI to do some sort of an investigation into Keith Ellison's action, the accusation of domestic abuse, I think this can clear the air. I mean, he is seeking one of the highest uh, uh, attorneys uh, generals in the state, so I think that we need to pay close attention to that if he wants to enforce the laws in the state of Minnesota, we have to make sure that he plays by the rules that he would impose. Betty McCollum, I'll let you respond, then we'll move on. Well, you know, Judge Kavanaugh's appointment is going to be for a lifetime. And uh, if, uh, if, if voters... Uh, uh, after this election, um, if, if Keith were to, were to become the attorney general, w- there would be something that would come to light. They would have the ability to, to, take, to take action and do something. So I really think that these are uh, two different examples of a, of a larger problem. And I'll go back to it again. It starts with military uh, assault. It starts with um, what happens in in the workplace, and and I've been a victim of it as a woman. So I take this very seriously that women need to be heard, uh, women need to be listened to, but we need to have a process. We as a society need to come up with a process when it isn't in a criminal a court system, of a way of making sure that that things are adjudicated, and that uh, we move forward. W- what I hope happens is maybe this conversation isn't taking place 20 years from now. I'd like to say two, you know, two years from now this conversation wouldn't take place. But uh, as a person who's uh, um, been a victim of it um, myself in, in the workplace, it, it is something I take very seriously. Uh, let's just move to some other issues. Greg Ryan, uh, it seems that hardly a week goes by that you don't hear about uh, one of these mass shootings. I think we've had two this week, one in Wisconsin, one in Maryland. Would, do you think the federal government needs to do anything to change uh, gun laws? Well, as soon as we start looking at the First Amendment to change the First Amendment, then we can proceed to the Second Amendment to change that. Other than that, I wouldn't want to see any uh, changes in the federal law. The states have those rights to make their uh, gun laws uh, different and more stringent. But when it comes to the federal level, my father was held up, shot, and murdered at our plumbing store 34 years ago. So I am a victim of a murdered father. So I can speak from experience that had he uh, had protection then, he would still be with us if, his, if God granted him that uh, length. Betty McCollum, any uh, legal changes, any law changes at the federal level about guns? Well, first off, um, losing your father in such a tragic circumstance is something that um, I you know, Mr. Ryan's talked about before, and um, 
uh, for the loss for your family once again. My my sympathies and my condolences. And I have nothing against uh, people having uh, hunting rifles or people having guns for self protection. But with that, I think we uh, can can make some uh, changes to make sure that. Uh, things uh, don't happen, these mass shootings, especially in our schools. Universal background checks to make sure that people will be responsible gun owners to have uh, access to guns. What we're seeing with the, these bump stocks still have, you know, we should, everybody after that happened, um, the, the massive uh, shooting out west, everybody was like, oh, we're going to ban bump stocks. We haven't done anything uh, on that as Congress. The assault weapons ban. I mean, I serve on the Defense Committee. I know the difference between a hunting rifle, a, a gun for self-protection, and an assault, assault weapon. We don't need assault weapons uh, out out in, in the public. The things like the fly-no-buy list right now, uh, you know, somebody can be not be able to fly a plane, but they can still go, uh, fly on a plane. Uh, because they're on a terrorist watch list, but they can go in and purchase uh, uh, as many guns as, as is allowed at, during a, a time. So th- there are things that we can do um, to uh, reduce gun violence in, in this country. And uh, I just think it's common sense uh, to, to work to do that, but that doesn't mean taking guns away from people for self-protection, such as in the Ryan family case, or for people to have the right um, to go out and, and recreate, ski shoot, or or or, or hunt, but okay. g- guns for any reason at any time without a background check, especially assault weapons, I have a real problem with that. Okay, uh, let me uh, ask about the immigration issue. Some uh, Democrats have called for ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, to be abolished. Uh, would you support that, Betty McCollum? We need to make sure that ICE is doing its job properly. And by by that, I mean we need to pass real, meaningful immigration reform. Um, we need security at our borders. We're going to need to have, um, you know, enforcement for people who um, are, are breaking, uh, breaking our, our laws. I mean, so we're going to have law enforcement. But the way that this administration has, um, you know, separated children and families at the borders. We had 500 uh, children at one time separated from their parents. Only 200 of them have been returned. There's thousands of children um, over the past um, uh, several years that have been put into foster care that the federal government doesn't even know where they are right now. So we need smart immigration policies. Greg Ryan, what about immigration uh What we need to do is enforce the laws that are on the books right now instead of proceeding with a complete overhaul. Our immigration system is a little different than it was 30 years ago, so we really need what hasn't been happening is full enforcement of the federal laws on immigration, and it has expanded, so we need to uh, not expand it as much and keep it back to the way and enforce it the way it is now before we decide changing anything in the future. So that's uh, my feeling on that. Uh, what about the president's uh, position on tariffs and trade? Uh, looks like we're in a trade war now. Do you back the president on his tariffs? I do, and I'll tell you why. The tariffs are a tool to bring the playing field down to a level uh, game. Right now, the United States, I can understand if I'm negotiating with three different people and or if I negotiated with one person. It makes it almost twofold or threefold complex when you're dealing with three different nations or more. So when it comes to the trade, his ultimate goal would be to reduce it down to zero hmm. trade deficits, zero tariffs, and that's what we have to do. I look out in the parking lot and I look at all of the foreign cars, and when I go buy plumbing parts, I see this made in China. And it, and it really bothered me a lot that us consumers, we love spending money. And we don't like spending a lot. We like getting a good deal. And if we are getting products from out of the country, us as Americans, we need to have a closer look at that and pay attention to where that product is manufactured, where the money ends up at, and is it in the United States. Betty McCollum, we're down to our last minute. Where are you on the tariffs and trade? Well, the president doesn't seem to have a policy that anybody can follow. I mean, attacking uh, our neighbor to the north, Canada, 
um, and some of the complications that, that that's involving. And with even the U.S. auto industry is, is foolish and it's going to make things more expensive for consumers. Certainly, we need to do something about China and, and stealing intellectual property. There's things to, there are things we can do to improve trade, but uh, the president going after Canada, the EU, um, some of our close allies, um, and making um, making irrational decisions that no one can follow is just is just foolish and not good for our economy. Well, I'm afraid we have to end it there. I was hoping we'd have some time for final statements, but we used up too much of our time. I really appreciate your coming by, though. DFL Congresswoman Betty McCollum, Republican Greg Ryan, running in the 4th District this year. Uh, Early voting starts today. It does. Everybody needs to vote. Thanks again for coming. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for listening. That's our program for today. I'm Mike Mulcahy.